Sometimes people are thinking them little candies with the M with the stent. Hopefully, this will be sweet tonight. All right. Uh, M&M's, because the things I want to mention to you start with the letter M. And it is Pentecost Sunday. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 18 for the reading of the scripture this evening. And let's stand as we read the scripture. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, notice the day of Pentecost. We're celebrating Pentecost Sunday today. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord, unity. One accord and in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were setting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. I like that. All filled with the Holy Ghost, not just some. <laughs> all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, the dwellers of Mesopotamia, in Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Pythagra and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in the parts of Libya and Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? And that's one of the M's, okay? And what's this mean? What meaneth this? Others mocking, I won't, draw, I won't uh, focus on that M, okay? I will mention something about it, persecution, that starts with a P. But it's a name mocking, okay? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with them, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, fulfilled prophecy. It shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Amen. Lord Jesus, tonight I ask that your presence be with us. As we deliver our soul of this message tonight, open the ears of those that are here, and, oh God, cause them to hear the word and take it down into the inner man. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. I want to start out with a question tonight and ask you, now you don't have to answer out loud, but there probably will be some opinions. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word Pentecost? Fire, did you say? And someone else want to answer out loud? When I say the word Pentecost or Pentecostal, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Holy Ghost. Separation. Okay, we got a few answers here, and I've got all those down here as answers, all right? When I was young, and I thank God I was born and raised and brought up in the church, but when I was a child, there was a definite order as to what you thought or what people thought of you as being Pentecost or Pentecostal. And uh, first of all, I mean, just as a, as a toddler, uh, I was made fun of a lot. Tongue talker. Right? Holy roller. <laughs> Jesus' name. Hmm? Born again. Some have already mentioned Holy Ghost fire. I even heard people uh, talking behind my back about a cult. 
little Christ. Now, there's a host of other things that people might think when it comes to mind when they hear the word Pentecost or Pentecostal. And as a, young, as a youngster, I, I mean, I, I had no choice of where I went to church. My mom and dad took me. I'm glad they took me to a Pentecostal church. You say, why? Because, Brother Al, there I heard the truth. All right, in the word of the Lord. And I want to continue in truth. But as a youngster, Pentecost was not popular. It was persecuted. Pentecost wasn't popular. It was persecuted. Now, funny, but not so funny. Things that once distinguished us as being Pentecostal are no longer the distinguishing features. That tells me something has changed. As a matter of fact, I'm wondering if we may have lost our identity because when you say the word Pentecost or Pentecostal now, people don't think of the things in a persecuting way. It has become popular, and uh, therefore we are losing our identity because we have assimilated, if I can use that word, into Christendom and other denominations. There's been an ecumenical movement that hasn't helped us for sure, charismatics, and we're losing that identity of being originals. Three M's. I want to look at Pentecost as a memory. Pentecost in the past. I want to look at Pentecost, what it means to us today, and I want to look at the marks of Pentecost. All right, so memory, means, and marks. Now, there are some others. There's methods and all that, but I haven't got time to do all that tonight. So Pentecost is. What is Pentecost? It's more than a name. Remember uh, the Lord addressing the seven churches in the book of Revelation, he told one, he said, you have a name that you're living, but you're dead. Pentecost is more than a name. It's more than a denomination or an organization. As I mentioned the message this morning, Pentecost is an experience. A one God, tongue-talking, holy roller, born again, heaven-bound believer in the liberating power of Jesus' name. When I talk about the experience of Pentecost, one that will transform the life of a sinner and make him a saint. One that will regenerate an ungodly man and make him godly and holy. One that will produce power to live a spiritual life above reproach. That's what Pentecost is, was, and should be. Pentecost is a biblical term and, as a matter of fact, one of three Jewish festivals. The Jews were commanded to keep three feast days in their year. Pentecost was one of them, and it was the middle one. The first feast was that of tabernacles, and it was celebrated four months after Pentecost in the middle of the seventh month, and it commemorated their wilderness wanderings. And then there was the Feast of Weeks, which is what we're preaching about tonight, known as Pentecost, and that was the middle one. Just, excuse me, I just lost my place here. I'll get it in a minute. Modern technology has just jumped on me. Okay. There we are. Jumped again. Let me get that. The second one, the Feast of Pentecost, celebrated in the first fruits of harvest. The third one was that of unleavened bread, and it followed the Feast of Passover. Pentecost, that middle feast, was to be different. It was observed 50 days after the Passover feast, seven full weeks and one day, 49 plus 150, meaning of Pentecost is 50. It was then that God chose to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Here it was, a feast day, that of Passover, and the Lord was using the occasion to birth or to bring the birthday of the church, which was founded by the outpouring of his spirit. We read to you in our text in verse number 12 that there were people gathered from 16 or 17 different nations there in Jerusalem, and when they heard everybody speaking the wonderful works of God in their own tongue, knowing that they're only Galileans, they asked the question, what does this mean? Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost. He gave the essence of it. They're not drunk. It's the third hour of the day. No a decent Jew would be drinking at that hour of the day. But he said, this is the fulfilling of prophecy, the promise that in the last days God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. This is a brand new day. The church has just started, and it's starting in a blaze of glory. And I want to tell you, I believe the church is going out in a blaze of glory too. Amen. Now, there may be a falling away of some, but there's also a coming in or a gathering in of others. I want to be among those that's on fire when Jesus comes back for his church. 
There was a pattern to what happened there on the day of Pentecost. So let me talk to you about history. Some 2,000 years ago as it started, the pattern that was there. Number one, they were gathered together with a certain purpose in mind. I mentioned purpose this morning was the harvest. The other purpose even before the harvest was that they were gathered there at the command of Jesus to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. There was 120 of them went back to Jerusalem, went to an upper room. They were praying and praising. They were in one accord. It's hard to get that today. But that's how Pentecost started out. You say, well, what was it? Unified purpose, unity. And I'm thankful to be preaching in a church where I believe there is relative unity, okay? I have been in some others where there was a fight going on all the time. That's not the way Pentecost started out. Amen. They were gathered together with a unified purpose. And that unified purpose was to see people baptized with the Holy Ghost. All right. So united together. Pentecost as it started 2,000 years ago. I gathered, they were waiting for the promise of the Father. 2,000 some years later, we're gathered here tonight. And how many came with anticipation and expectation of seeing somebody get the Holy Ghost tonight? I'm glad there's one that did. For the rest of us, probably honest, you came to church tonight out of tradition. It's what we do. We'll go and we'll worship, you know, sing some songs. Someone will sing a special song. Pastor will preach and we'll go home. And that's the expectation you came with. (laughs) That's not the expectation of the early church. The early church, they came together with one purpose and unit, to see someone baptized in the Holy Ghost. And we need to get back to Pentecost where our church services are that way. We're in expectation and anticipation of somebody receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, a personal Pentecost. It was a day of praise. So they were unified together with the purpose of receiving the Holy Ghost. They praised and worshipped while they were waiting together, some seven to ten days. And uh, notice that after they received the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues, and even after Peter preached the message on the day of Pentecost, they continued with worship and praise. That's what happens when the Holy Ghost fills you. You want to worship and praise the author of the one that put that spirit on the inside. So I ask you tonight, are you truly Pentecostal in experience, or are you a fan of Pentecost? Fans go to watch. (laughs) I want to be a player. (laughs) All right? I don't want to be a spectator. I want to be a participator. Oh, yes. The power and praise that was uh, evident on the day of Pentecost. There was power. Chapter 1, verse 8 of Acts said, power to be witnesses. Now, I like the power that is in the Holy Ghost. And yes, I love to worship and praise, love to sing. Uh, I would dance and run if I could. (laughs) All right. Uh, Exuberance and uh, even a lot of emotion. I believe that should be showed. All right. Signs did follow the believers as they begin to worship. Speaking in tongues. Right. Casting out devils. All these signs, wonders, and miracles. There was power that was present. Not just power to praise and worship, but power to effectively do something for the kingdom. And the first list among them was to be witnesses. So there was also proclamation on that day of Pentecost. Peter, standing up with the eleven, said, this is what's happening. The fulfilling of prophecy. It was told what happened. And today, we need not to be ashamed or hold back on our experience. I'll give you an example of that. I've mentioned this different times before. And if you're working a job, you'll go there tomorrow, maybe, and someone will talk about the party they had on their weekend and they get up, their head feeling like a football and thought they were going to die. But oh my, wasn't it a party? And they'll tell all about and swear and curse while they're doing it, and you're listening. They're not one shamed a bit of what they did. Well, why should we sit down and take a back seat to that? <laughs> why not it next be our turn? Well, <clears throat> I went to church on Sunday morning. The presence of power of God come down there, seeing somebody filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking of tongues as the Lord gave the others, woke up with a clear head <laughs> and desire to worship God. What's happening? Proclaiming <laughs> the experience, proclaiming the message that needs to happen. It did on the day of Pentecost. 
So there's an observation between now and then. The pattern seems to have changed. Their purpose for gathering together was to see someone receive the Holy Ghost. They were gathered together in unity. Are these happening today? Uh, today we even boast of power that's given to us in the Holy Ghost, but do we deliver on the goods? Back then the preaching was to see someone else saved. Today our preaching takes the curve of entertain or encourage for another week rather than to see somebody saved. The pattern has changed. Now, if we're going to see people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the pattern needs to go back to the original. Amen. 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 So that, uh, and tonight would be the, uh, talking about Pentecost, the memory of Pentecost, what it was, what we see it today. We need the old-fashioned baptism of the Holy Ghost, a brand-new Pentecost, a stirring, a fire all over you. What about the meaning a Pentecost, the second M there, uh, meaning 50. We've already covered that. Pentecost uh, was prophecy that had fulfilled the promise of the Father, Joel 2.28, that in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and, see, and your young men see visions, your old men dream dreams. Isaiah chapter 28 and 11, with a stammering lip and another tongue will I speak to this people. Matthew chapter 3 and 11, I, he said, uh, I'm going to baptize you with the, or I baptize you with water. That was John speaking. He said, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. This was all what was going to happen. And we've seen that happen on the day of Pentecost. So Pentecost means that Jesus kept his promise, and fulfilled the prophecy he gave by the Old Testament prophets. And you've seen it happen on the day of Pentecost and any time since. In John chapter 14, for verse 15, he said, I will send the promise of my Father upon you, a comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. In Luke chapter 24 and 49, he said, Terry and Jerusalem tell you be nude with power from on high. Acts chapter 1, 48, wait for the promise of the Father which is the Holy Ghost. It means that Jesus is alive to perform what he promised. I'm glad my Jesus is alive, not dead in a grave somewhere. Pentecost means there's power to witness. I've already mentioned that. Salvation is open to all. Look in chapter 2 and verse 38 when Peter, seeing that the people were convicted when he preached the message, said, you're the ones that has crucified the Lord of glory. They said, what are we going to do about that? He said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. Ye shall receive the Holy Ghost. Promises unto you, to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That includes everybody. Amen. We've seen sprinkles of it in the Old Testament. We see the outpouring in the New Testament. Pentecost means that God uses imperfect people and puts something powerful on the inside of them. Wow. He chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the things that are wise. He chooses ungodly Gentiles and makes them godly. Wow. Those who are far off... Let him that is a thirst come, according to Revelation 22, 17. And John chapter 7 and verse 37, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. This spake he of the Holy Ghost, which they that believe on him should receive. It's for you, your children, all that are far off. So what does it mean? Prophecy has been fulfilled. Jesus keeps his promises, and you can be witnesses. Hallelujah. I'm thankful for what... Pentecost means. Now let me deal with that third M here tonight. Pentecost M and M's. All right. All right. The marks. The distinguishing fixtures or distinguishing marks of a Christian. What should a Christian be? What need be like? Go back to Pentecost again to find what they are. First of all, when the Lord filled those early folks with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they were praying when that happened. Now, I, I still like to praise and worship the Lord, but where is prayer? Prophecy at the turn of the century, Azusa Street. Prophecy given that in the last days that the people would praise and worship a God to whom they no longer prayed. Praise and worship is a wonderful thing, but prayer is where the power comes from. 
Acts 1 verse 14, these all continued in prayer and supplication. Acts 2 42, they continued in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Acts 4 31, when they had prayed, the place was shaken. Amen. At Pentecost, there was a pattern there of prayer. Jude 20, build up yourself in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Back at the early church, when the Holy Ghost was outpoured, there were people that prayed, not just pray, praise and worship. They prayed. Back when the early church started out, there was a people that lived pure in the presence of the Lord. It was, after all, a Holy Ghost, not a rascal Holy Ghost. Right? It was a Holy Ghost. And he said, be ye holy for I am holy. And we need to be his offspring. God hasn't called us to uncleanness but unto holiness. He's called us to sanctification and honor, to separation and salvation. Follow peace with all men, Hebrews chapter 9, 25. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. 1 John chapter 2, 15, Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. I, I will be a God unto you and you shall be my people. We need to possess our vessels in sanctification and honor. I'll tell you, when the early church started out, they not only prayed, they lived a life of purity. Yeah, it is. Right? Today, I mean, shake your head sometimes. And some will tell you, I got the Holy Ghost last night. And your eyes went, you did? Wonderful, that's great. Yeah, I went to the pub afterwards. I mean, that, that should shock us to death. Say, so why, that didn't happen in early Pentecost. They come out from among them and were separate. They didn't do the things of the world. The power within them caused them to not want the things of the world. It was a holy ghost. Amen. There was power to live above reproach. In, in Acts chapter 3, verse 1 through 8, Peter and John went to the temple at the hour of prayer. And uh, there was a lame man sitting there at the gate. And he said, I want you to look on us. And he said, we don't have any silver and gold, but we do have something. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And he said, he leaping up stood and went with them walking and leaping and praising God into the temple. What happened? There was a power of miracles, signs, and wonders that accompanied the Holy Ghost. Power to witness. Power to perform miracles. Acts 6 and verse 8. Stephen full of faith and power. And so we need to take our pattern again from the early church. Live pure lives when the Holy Ghost comes in and power accompanies it. They took that lame man that Peter and John made whole and they were going to kick him out of the synagogue. Mom and dad wouldn't testify for him. He said, ask him yourselves. He said, uh, uh, who healed you? And you guys say that that man named Jesus, uh, if we even mention his name, we'd be kicked out of the synagogue. Whether he's a sinner or saint, I don't know, but there's something I do know. Once I was blind, now I see. Power that accompanied the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Praise and worship also continued after the Holy Ghost was given. In Acts chapter 2 and 11, they heard them speak, in their own languages, the wonderful works of God. In chapter 2, verse 46 and 7, they continued daily in the temple, praising God. And there was great joy in the city in Acts 8 and 8, John 4 and 24. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, and it takes both. There was prayer. There was purity. There was power. There was praise and worship. These are definitely the marks of Pentecost. Whew. Amen. The marks. There was zeal. Zeal. Oh, yeah. They didn't mind telling what had happened to them. Acts 2, 47. And then the Lord added daily to the church such as should be saved. He can still add daily. We just got to tell it. Acts 8 and verse 4. 
uh, they decided we're going to gather together and huddle around Jerusalem. And Jesus said, that's not my intention. I give you the Holy Ghost to reach the world. I give you a great commission. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature and you're going to send around Jerusalem. I'll fix that. Let's send some persecution and scatter them. He says, they went everywhere preaching the word. The Lord working with them in signs and wonders. Philip went down to Samaria and you know, he had a revival there. And the Ethiopian eunuch. And then there was uh, some others that went down. Like Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. How he received the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you. Uh, maybe we need a little bit of persecution. It was the marks of Pentecost when I was even a child. But I can remember going to school. And people making fun of me audibly. In front of other people. Some that even went to the church I went to. For you that want to hear, those are the hypocrites, okay? <laughs> Making fun of the real. <laughs> All right. Observation. Prayer seems to be a thing of the past. Oh, we love our singspirations and our church suppers, practices of all kinds, fundraisers that take the place of the prayer meeting. Now, I'm not condemning those things. I'm just saying they should not take the place off. Purity, what shall I say? When uh, young people can come to you and they're sleeping together the night before and not even have any conviction of having done anything wrong, unwed. It's acceptable in our government and in our society and they feel the church should accept it too. But the Lord never will. You say, why? His word does not change. And he wants us to be a holy and a pure people. Power, oh, we can sing, we can holler, jump, shout, and dance, but that doesn't bring the power down. You know what brings the power down? Living holy. Amen. There's a difference between excitement and power. Power comes as a result of holy living. Again, Peter and John said, uh, you look on us as though by our own power or our own holiness that we made this man to walk. It wasn't our own power and our own holiness. It's that which came forth from the Spirit. Oh, there was a pattern to Pentecost. Amen. There was zeal. And there's something mentioned in the Scripture about zeal, but not according to the knowledge. And I don't want to be one of those. When zeal, I want to be able to teach people from the Word of God, teach them truth, teach it in an unoffensive way, but hold back nothing. And tell them out love what they need to do. I do know of some that when they got the Holy Ghost, the, the uh, discernment, discretion, wisdom was lacking. All they had was zeal, but not according to knowledge. And they drove more people away than they brought in. Oh, Lord, help us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Amen. Amen. So that is the third part of our message, the marks of Pentecost. Three M's, the memory, what it was back then, present day, the meaning, what it is today, and the marks, what it should mean to us personally. Amen. Now, 2,000 years ago, the Pentecostals were persecuted for their beliefs. They were. They didn't fit in. And today, you mention Pentecost or Pentecostal, it seems to fit in quite comfortably. You no longer hear them talking about, well, it's a cult. We don't hear persecuting words like, hey, little Christ, or holy, or they're too straight, or this and that. Oh, Lord, I, I don't really want to face persecution and such, but if that's what it takes. Amen? I want to live... And be a genuine Pentecostal like it was in the early church so that I can see others born into the kingdom and reap the harvest and take others to heaven with me and not that other place. Right. So there was a pattern to Pentecost. There was praise. There was power. There was proclamation. As far as doctrine, there was prophecy. There was promises and there was power. As far as lifestyle, the marks, there was prayer, there was purity and power, praise and worship and zeal. These were the marks of the Pentecostals. So I close with saying this tonight. Are the marks on you? Who was it that said, I bear in my body the marks 
of the Lord Jesus. That was the Paul, Apostle Paul. He went through some things. He suffered. Over there in 2 Corinthians, he gave a whole list of things. He said, look, I've suffered many things from my countrymen and in perils of the dark and in the deep and in perils of my own countrymen. He said, I've been persecuted, thrice stoned, beaten, cast, all these. And beside all that, then there's the care of the churches. But I'll tell you what, he had a genuine power of Pentecost on the inside of him that separated him from a world, and he wasn't going to turn back to it. He was going to proclaim the gospel so that others could receive Jesus for themselves. He was a genuine, original Pentecostal. And I want to be one of those too. Amen. Would you stand tonight? Sister, if you could come back to the piano. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Only a few of us gathered together here tonight. Hopefully that doesn't hinder the spirit of worship in your own heart and life. I want us to gather together around the front here tonight. And just let the word of God sink into our heart. Lord, help us to be the true apostolic Pentecostal people you've called us to be. Lord, let our prayer life and our praise be acceptable to you. Help us to be separate from this world. Let us proclaim the gospel that others may be saved. Help us to gather together in unity and help to be able to tolerate my brother and sister in Christ and, and get along. Oh, Lord Jesus, uh, the end time is upon us, and we don't want to be uh, uncomfortable in church, but rather comfortable with the word of God. It's the sinners that ought to be uncomfortable, but for a good reason, feeling conviction that they need to change their lives. Oh, Lord, help us, we pray, to be real. Oh, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, oh, God, as we look at Pentecost and what it was, a memory. Lord, it's not a memory today. It's a real experience. Lord, what it means to us today and then the marks that's placed upon us because of that experience, help us to be the genuine originals in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Would you gather out towards the altar here tonight? Let's pray.